Oh, man. If you are tuning in at 1.30, if you're playing a little hooky from lunch, you have made a great decision because I bet you didn't expect to see this. We got Kevin Garlington of Total Tennis Domination Woo. getting ready to dominate the court. Like, this is going <laughs> above and beyond. Super brave. He's out on the court. And what are you going to be doing? What are you going to be doing for us today, Mr. Kevin? We're going to talk about the key, three keys to bulletproofing your forehand. Some real, I think, new concepts. Probably not new concepts the way I look at them, but concepts can really help your forehand and help you uh, develop a smooth, consistent forehand without feeling robotic. Oh, see that that there goes my theory. Since you said this is new stuff, I thought you were going to have an AI teach us how to hit a forehand today, but. This is the That's opposite of robotic. Next That's next <laughs> month. Okay. Hey, guys, as you're coming on in, say hello to Kevin. And uh, we're, we're excited to see you guys here. And, um, yeah, so uh, I'm just going to let you take it away. By the way, uh, guys, in the chat section here, I've put Kevin also has a bonus. What, do you, what is the free bonus that people are going to be able to do if they click that link? If you click the link, you're going to get a – Basically, you're going to hear a lot of new, the concepts we're going to talk about today. But really, the, the, the huge bonus is that I'm going to give you a complete forehand course A to Z. Uh, total tennis domination. We're going, we're going to try a new route this, I guess, not the end of the year or the new year. But this, we're going to start delivering courses where basically you can have access to the entire thing for free. We're going to create what? an entire catalog of unbelievable free courses. I want you to share it with everybody. And so, yeah. So after that, starting on Monday, what is it, September 25th, we're dropping you an entire, entire, not like here's a little thing, A to Z, forehand course. So sign up. That's that's pretty that's pretty cool. That that's pretty nice. Uh, <laughs> Britt says hello, Kevin. Hi, Pete. It's Carmen from TennisCon Live 23. Good to see you, Britt. Or Car is it Carmen? It's not Britt. It's Carmen. Good to see you, Carmen. Oh, Carmen! Yes, Carmen. Yeah. All right. That is awesome. She's fooling us with the Brit. She was on last night too. We had um, we had a great time last night with Jonathan Stokey. He was really good. All right. Okay. Lindsay says. Lindsay and Andrew say super pumped. Love the live on court format. Feels like I'm watching the U.S. Open again, but with instruction. Oh, that's pretty cool. Oh, I like that. That's awesome. Thank you. That is a beautiful court. Where is that court? That is a gorgeous court. Where are we, we watching? We are from? in um, Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, basically Tulsa, Oklahoma. This is Cedar Ridge Country Club that we're at right now. And so, yeah, this is kind of where we do our stuff right now, uh, both my wife and I, and Total Sense Domination. Now, how did you get so lucky to find a wife who can hit a ball? Like, that's the coolest thing. Anytime you want to hit a good ball, you say, hey, honey, let's go hit some balls. I know. I mean, seriously, we've been actually hitting a lot lately, and it's been so much fun. Uh, it's it's been a part of this process that we'll talk about later that I've been going through, uh, learning new things, researching tons of research lately, and uh, coming up with some new concepts. But yeah, she's been a big part about helping me going out, hit, testing things, tweaking things, and seeing what's working, what doesn't working, and having the opportunity to be here daily and say, okay, let's try this on a junior, adult, two o, three o. Three five. So yeah, it's been it's been awesome, and she's a, a big part of that. You hear that, guys? He goes, "I'm learning new stuff about the forehand teaching forehand." You never just think, "I've got a pretty good forehand." What else is there to possibly know? Like it's uh, it's just a forehand. Like how <laughs> how do we need to know anything more than it's a forehand? What what can you possibly be learning out there, Kevin? Oh, I could, always learning, but I just put it that way. I am always tinkering, going, "How can I basically make it easier to learn a forehand?" and make the process less frustrating. Uh, I think learning tennis shouldn't be as frustrating as it is. It's a, sport, it's a sport that you gotta practice, you gotta develop skills. But I think that's definitely, if we can shave off just a hair of frustration for so many people out there so they can enjoy the sport and stick with it and, and do that journey, I mean, it's awesome. Just quick plug for tennis that, I mean, I've had so many unbelievable opportunities through tennis and I want people to share that, whether it be Whatever level you're playing at, where you're playing at, meeting friends, tennis has just been an unbelievable sport, and um, I'm super excited just to be able to be a part of it. That's awesome. Well, we're just going to say hello to a couple more people, then I'm going to let you yeah. take the floor, and I'm going to actually put you in the solo shot. All right, so we got GB, who is at our um, Cincinnati Masterclass Clinic. We had a lot of fun. She's, 
She's also awesome. She helped me with my body, which was great. And uh, can't wait to see you. You're doing what you're with. You're doing with your forehand, says Alex. He's excited for this. Aloha, Kevin. Looking forward to see your lessons. Andrea from Hawaii. So, I mean, people are just excited. Then somebody says, LOL. I love that. Get yourself a wife that plays tennis. So, <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, go ahead. I'm going to put I you in the solo layout. So, I'm going to go away here. But you are live, buddy. So, I'm going to let you go. Sweet. Uh, Peter, one other thing, because I can't quite see all the chat because I'll be distancing. So if you see any questions or something comes up, just interject, let me know, because I won't be able to see it. There's a little bit of a glare, but we'll, we'll rock it out, okay? Okay. And I apologize that I, I don't know what it is, but it seems like whenever you bring out a camera and you're trying to do something, someone's mowing grass or there's got to be some noise. So, I mean, it just wouldn't be normal without it. So I'll just say that now. Mm. Uh, that happens all. I I cannot tell you how much I empathize with you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here we go. I want to start off with this, with the idea of hitting a forehand. Let's start off with like what makes hitting sometimes or learning a forehand so frustrating. I think a lot of times it's like how many things you have to go out and do. I mean, if you if you think about like when you learned a forehand, it was like okay, I got to take it back here. I got to move my feet this way, and you're probably still doing this. You're having all these ideas. And I think that's probably one of the things that creates so much frustration is because we have our focus everywhere. I mean, just think about this. If you could go out and practice your forehand, but you're trying to tweak something, you're trying to focus on it, how good is your forehand when you're practicing? Pretty much it's not good because you're, you're focusing on this and the ball, the ball literally goes past you and you're like, what just happened? And so one of the things that as I've retooled everything and thought about is how can I clear the clutter? How can I clear the clutter for everybody? And so three main concepts that I think is so important is understanding where you should focus. A hand, your hand is just an extension of the racket and creating what I call the contact structure. And I think with these three things, it can really like narrow what you need to focus on and give you a forehand that is smooth, uh, natural, um, when you go out and you, you feel comfortable with it. Because I think a lot of times we get in the habit of we see a pro and we're like, I need to do it like that. But here's the thing about it, if you really think about it, how many pros are exactly the same? If you really think about it, there's pretty much no pro that hits the ball exactly the same. I'm gonna pull up one just because I feel like he's kind of a carbon copy, but he, he's still not the same, which is like, if you look at Federer, and you look at Dimitrov, there, there's been some emulation there, but not the same, it can't happen because we're all human, we're all different. And so what we wanna do is take advantage of our differences, whether you be more flexible, more loose or whatever. And this will make more sense as we go through the thing. So the very first thing I want you to think about is where should our focus be? And I think the most important part, or I would love to ask a question, maybe Peter can tell me what everybody thinks. What do you think is the most important moment of hitting a tennis ball? Most important moment, guys. We'll wait a couple of minutes because yeah, we have a little bit of a moment. slight delay. Uh, okay. So let's see um, what people come up with. And uh, Are we yeah, this about is... the take back, the yeah. preparation, uh -huh. the drop. What do you guys think the, the most position? important moment is? We're waiting for some answers. Um, as you're saying this, Kevin, yeah, it'd be interesting to see how you're going to go through this. I, I hear what you're saying, but at the same point, it is a it is a complex game, right? I mean, it, it, we want to make it simple, totally. but at the same time, totally. it is it is complex. Okay. So here we go. I think the people I'm, – I'm going to guess – I don't know the answer what Kevin's going to say, but I'm going to guess that we've got some smart people because we got Lindsay and – and I'm just going to read all these out so you, so before you even say ah, the right or wrong. But we got contact point from Lindsay and Adam. Christopher says contact point. Contact point. William Peck, oh. contact point. Carmen oh. says contact point. Jack says Thank contact you. point. Thank contact you. point. Come on, Amen. when the ball strikes yeah. the racket. All right. Thank you. So Thank they, you. did they get it right? Nailed it. Nailed All right. It. Absolutely nailed it. And so <laughs> <laughs> when we, and totally I agree with Peter, it, it's totally about the contact, but we, we get so caught up in technique, I think too early sometimes, and we lose what I call this natural ability we all have. And so if the contact point's so important and leading to my next concept, is that the racket's just an extension of her hand. Really, we're just playing with our hand. And if you mm. think about it, if I just had you go out there, I'm gonna back up a little bit. 
and said, hey, just hit the ball with your hand. Just walk over and hit the ball with your hand. You walk over casually and just hit the ball with your hand. This is in your way. You, you walk over and no big deal. There's not a lot of thinking that has to go on. Because, I mean, if you think about my hand here, if I put my hand behind my head right here, do you know, or I mean, if you did it, do it right now. Put your hand behind your body. Do you know where your hand is? Do you know what direction it's pointing? Now, I mean, I can cheat right now because I can see the camera, but I know exactly it's pointing this direction. It's pointing up, it's pointing down. There's something about, you know, where your hand is in space and time, right? The problem is when we get to learning tennis in the general, in the beginning, we put a racket in our hand and we grab all the way down at the bottom and we're like, hey, and we have no clue. And I, I love the thing where I'm, I'm working with somebody and they're like, they're taking it back. Or when I used to do it the old way, they take it back and they're like, they're always looking at the racket. Okay. They're, it's like split focus. Now we can't focus on the contact because we're looking at a racket. And so the idea is that we really want to start playing with our hands first. And what I think that does is really cut down on like, what do you, what do you need to do, focus on? Basically your hand and the ball. And it's a more, I think, natural way of thinking of it because we've all probably had some experience of either catching a ball, touching an object, how do you, how do you need to move to it? And so that's the first thing we want to clear the clutter. Because generally, I think we start with this idea of, okay, we got we to gotta take the racket back. And we do. We got to do all that stuff. But we lose what I think is really important. And so the final concept, and we're going to go through some drills and really kind of walk you through this, is the idea of the hitting structure. And so when I think about what's consistent throughout tennis, like when, when I look at other players, like what's consistent? Like the kind of, I mean, everybody does a, a general unit turn, but how do they do it? I mean, I mean, is the racket always up? Or is it down? Or is it this way? I mean, we sat so many different ways. Um, when they do the racket drop, is it past the dog? Is it on edge? I mean, if you look at players, they're all different. Okay. But one thing that I think is universal, personal, person, personal preference, is what I call the contact structure. And what the contact structure is, is when we're making contact that my chest is forward. Okay. My arm is away from my body. Okay. My racket is in a neutral to about 45 degree angle just right here. And so I'll show you from the side here. Next time you go and you start watching any professional player, any college player, you will see that they consistently hit the contact structure regardless of the situation. I was watching this video of Stan. Stan is stepping across like this and you would think he's like here, but he still hit the contact structure. But think about what I think a lot of us struggled with when we're hitting balls here mm -hmm. and here. And here, and then your pro or someone tells you, okay, now the problem is you're not rotating, but then you rotate and you're still too close. And so yeah. in general, when we first start off, we start off like this. This is a classic one. I've done this one to people too. I'm sorry. But as I've learned, I really think that the way we should start is just thinking of the contact structure, just like this. And so let's walk through some things if we think about this. If the rack is just an extension of our hand and I have this contact structure with my hand, this now helps me learn so many things because I think one of the biggest things when we go out and take a lesson, whether you are a little bit more experienced or not, tennis is a moving game where you have to move first and hit second. And so generally when we take a lesson and it's totally fine, we play a static or we take a static lesson. Someone drop feeds us balls in the same spot or feeds us balls in the same spot, but then we go out and play what happens. You never get the same ball ever. I love this quote by uh, Nadal. Um, I'll paraphrase it, which is, you know, he never gets the same ball, if you think about it. You never get the same ball in the same spot, with the same amount of spin, with the same amount of power, height. It's always different. So tennis is super dynamic. And so when you have the contact structure, it starts to teach you about how to be dynamic. And so I'll explain this. So if I'm right here, and you can take this at home, and I just think about, oh, this is a contact structure. I'm not going to think about footwork. I would just run, touch the ball just like this. Okay. And what this is teaching me is to keep my spacing. So this is also, hey, how do I keep the right spacing from the ball? So I was still here, keep my spacing. I'll grab a couple more balls. And so what it's teaching me is what's the most important time during your, your stroke of your forehand. It's learning to move over, boom, and adjust, boom, and adjust, boom. I'm constantly just, because this is no different than me kind of walking up and almost shaking your hand. It's something you already know. When you learn this way, I think, a lot of times, what if you, you kind of hit the ball this way and you get in the habit thinking this is an important spot, okay? But then you feel like, why am I so crammed? And then how do you adjust? And then you're focusing more on the swing 
and not focusing more on how to move and get the contact right. Because if you can move and get the contact right, that's half the battle. That's more than half of the battle. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's the good. first idea. Okay. Good Any, stuff. Now, can, can I, can I, uh, cause we have a question here. He's asked a couple of times. So I want to make sure we're not ignoring John. John says, no, yeah. how, how to stop pulling from contact point and looking up too early. Contact is soft. Forehand is weak. So John is saying, He's admitting, I've got bad contact. I look up too early. My forehand's soft and weak. Do you have any uh, little quick thoughts you can give? Any quick tips? Oh, totally, totally. Uh, I think here's another thing. And I, I equate a lot of these things as I've done so much research going through. The things you've seen and they've been obvious, but they're so obvious you miss them. It's like the, the Bruce Willis movie where he's like dead throughout the entire movie. And you're like, what? And you go back through and you're like, holy, I, I missed it all. And so... One thing is you see better and you see a lot of the best players do is that they keep looking at contact. Okay. And so was it John? Yep. John. Yeah. John, what I would suggest here, and we're a little jumping ahead and this will be covered in the course. This is actual a, a, a lesson in the course of working on, if I'm going to just do this here, I'm just going to keep looking at contact. Don't look where the ball's going. Just look at contact. Um, I love what I heard this quote by G Billie Jean King that, we think we have two contacts. We have the contact with the ball, and then we have, or, or sorry, two targets. We have the ball as the first target, and then we think about where we want the ball to go. The second one doesn't matter. If you do this one right, that one takes care of itself. And so a lot of times we're thinking about, okay, I hit, and we're instantly trying to focus on that target, and we miss that target. When if we focus on how we hit the ball here, and then see the result much later because we focus completely on the target of the ball. This one takes care of itself, John. So I would recommend that. That's been actually something I've been doing more and it's phenomenal. I've, I don't know, I've been playing for 30 years and I really realized that I just don't look at the contact enough. It's those little things that make a big difference. And again, from my level, I'm like, I don't look at the contact enough and it's made a huge difference for me. Mm, good stuff. Ke Kevin, can you believe this? It's, it is now 1.47. And we have 81 people on. Yeah. This is pretty cool. All right, keep going. You're doing a great job. Okay, so the first idea, regardless of your level, is just making sure that you can consistently get the structure right. Again, I, I really want you to go and start looking at videos. After you go watch this, go to any, pick your favorite five pros and watch that every time they make contact, they are right here. You're going to see some variation of the chessboard. This is here. This is the most important spot. So why don't we start there? Why don't we hit balls to ourselves where just with our hands, sorry, I'm jumping ahead. Just with my hand, I just get used to moving, okay? And hitting in my, my ideal structure. Even if I toss it behind me now, guess what? I'm teaching myself how to dynamically move and hit the ball in the right spot. And that is one of the biggest challenges for new players and even consistently or players who've been playing a while. I, I just started um, teaching a, a young lady and this is the first thing I worked with. And suddenly we could hit back and forth and she was consistently hitting the spot because I didn't start off this way where she was getting confused. She knew that no matter what, this is the most important spot. And so that this is kind of the very first kind of starting point of what I think is really important to bulletproofing your forehand. Ask yourself this question. When you make contact, are you making contact here? consistently or are you making contact here here okay or even sometimes here or out here if you watch the pros or really high level players consistently there consistently there so i want to kind of freeze there ask if there's any questions before we start moving on to kind of the next phase okay let me take let me take a look uh Let's see, we'll grab it. we Quick have drink. some comments. Judge the ball Ooh. equals contact point was two steps in Dennis Vandermeer's PTR forehand lesson after initial contact tap. Yeah. Um, eyes on the ball is the eye capable of seeing the contact point on the strings. Okay, so Christopher no. wants to know, that is the eye capable of seeing the contact point on the strings? No, not capable. Um, I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I think there's two parts of the eye. I'm not super familiar, but the cones and the rods. And I think one is in charge of specific focus. So like basically right now, everybody can see the ball right now. 
But as I drop this ball, it turns into a blur. So you're not actually looking for the contact. You're actually watching the blur. So if you think about right now, if I had this ball here, you're going to see my racket pass through it. You're going to see this blur. And so yeah. what we're looking for, because this ball is static, is actually as the ball is moving past, we're watching the blur of what's happening. We, we're not capable of having uh, specific or exact focus at that speed. But we are capable of watching the blur, and that's good enough. Believe me, I've been watching the blur, and I am absolutely shocked of, like, why haven't I been doing this before? So just to be clear, you cannot see the exact contact. What you're looking for is as, let's say, the ball is coming, I'm watching the blur of my swinging the ball. And you can also tell a couple things by that blur. You can get an idea of how you're impacting the ball. Are you coming through, slightly up or down, and make adjustments. So a lot of times I can hit a ball and go, okay, from that swing there, okay, look up later, where'd the ball go? And go, okay, let's see if I can repeat that if that's the type of ball I need to hit. Man, this is, yeah, you're on fire, dude. Yeah. I love this lesson. And it's so cool with you out on the court. Okay, here we go. We'll go, we'll go one more question and then we'll go uh, back to you with your next point. Now, I like this. This is a good handle. A lowly pawn like that. Should we design our contact point around which eye is dominant? This is, have you seen that yeah. Patrick Moore Taglu um, video? Totally. About the, okay. What do you think about totally. that? So do, do you like that I, idea? I actually do. And here's what I would say though. I have a module about that in the, the lesson you'll be receiving on Monday. Um, I think in the beginning, don't worry about it, but I do think it does make a difference. I'm right eye dominant. And so, and this is why even when I talk about footwork, I give footwork a, a lot more room to breathe because we all move differently. We all have different preferences of how we stretch and, and, and all those things make a difference. So a lot of times I find myself because I'm right eye dominant. So right now, this means my, my, my left eye, or sorry, my right eye is my dominant eye. And if I cover my left eye right here, I can see, I'm oh, sorry, I'll do it this way. I can't see any part in this kind of stance I'm in right now. Hopefully you can see me, Pete. I can't see any part of from the middle of the court over. Can't see it. But this is my dominant eye. What I do find myself doing is I choose to hit more open stance forehands and I choose to do different things like that. I much prefer sometimes, depending where, where the ball is coming, to hit open stance, sometimes open stance approaches, and I find that I hit them better. And so I do believe that there's, there, there's some credence there. Um, I think sometimes early on, don't worry about it. Because again, mm -hmm. what we're trying to do is clear the clutter. And so uh, when you get the forehand uh, program that I'm going to send you, there's two phases. The first phase is this understanding of the hand and where we're going to talk about how the wrist and kind of feeling and uh, 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 using your wrist to hit the ball. Mm -hmm. The second phase is once we have a hold on this, then we slowly add some technical things to start increasing your racket at speed. But we never lose focus on this, okay? Because if we lose focus on this and we start focusing too much here and we have too much attention here, we start losing our feel. And I've had this happen in my own uh, training where and before I was like, oh, I'm going to copy this from the pro. And I was so focused on doing this I would miss balls that I normally would have missed. I get super nervous. And mm -hmm. now I don't feel that way because I know it's like, look, what's the most important thing is here. So hopefully that answers your question. I do think eye dominance is something that, uh, depending on your level, if you find yourself missing balls, check it out. And so definitely I, I, I recommend watching Patrick's video. I think it's, it's pretty good. I was something that I did some more research on. I was like, okay, wow, this is something I missed out on. And so even with some of my students with certain things like volleys, how they align, I think it's important. Yeah, very cool. That, now, guys, you, you hear him talking about his forehand course. I just put the link again in the chat. So that link there, that long link, click on it. That's how you would get his free course on the forehand if you want. And if you're here watching this video, let's try and learn about the forehand from Kevin. Why would you not sign up for it? So, so go sign up for it. And then I just got one. There was a really good last second question. I know I said we're moving on, but this is a good question. Yeah, so, no, yeah you're good. Uh, RK says, when looking at the opponent, should we be looking at the ball specifically or in general gaze of the player hitting the ball? So like, yeah, that's a good one. Like how much do you read this focus on the ball versus like the overall body and what the body position is of the opponent? Go ahead. So you're, I'm assuming we're talking about, what was his name again? Sorry. Um, uh, it says RK. Okay, so I'm assuming you're talking about is 
I hit a ball, the ball's traveling to my opponent. Uh, what am I kind of looking at? Yeah. Um, honestly, I couldn't tell you specifically what I look at. I think one thing that happens is that through training, I've played so much, I can, I can see, or I, I can, I think my mind and your mind can um, figure out generally what's going to happen. Meaning that there's certain clues that you start picking up through just repetition. You know, I call them sometimes red flags. If I see an opponent stretching like this, I feel like they're going to hit a weaker ball. Like literally if I hit a ball and I don't even kind of consciously know, but if I see somebody hurt like that, I feel myself going forward. You know, um, just like if I see somebody loaded up here, I'm kind of bracing. I don't consciously do that. And I think those things will happen with time and trying to pay attention to go, as you hit the ball, just watch, just watch, take a snapshot. And then afterwards say, what happened? What did I see? And just casually do that. If you do it enough, you're going to build some repetition. The thing that if you're kind of con trying to consciously do that, it's, it's too fast. Um, I, I think they've done some eye studies with Roger Federer to figure out, you know, or sorry, maybe it was either Pete Sanford or Roger Federer talking about when someone can notice like, um, when they're going to serve and what they're going to do. And pretty much they're kind of at the last second kind of picking some things, but it's super unconscious. It's not a conscious thing where they're knowing. They're just like, oh, I feel this thing. You know, it's just almost like I would say, if I toss this ball at you, you wouldn't go lift my hand two degrees to the left, open the fingertips. You would just instantly go, boom, you know what to do through um, repetition of time. So hopefully that answers your question from my perspective. That's not the most scientific perspective, but um, it's something I will try to look into in the future. All right. Very good. You, by the way, we are over 90 people. Oh my gosh, this is amazing. All awesome. Right, go to the next, uh, the next phase here, Kevin. Okay, so if the rack is just an extension of your hand and you're starting here, then I feel like, and I would normally do this for closer to the net, but uh, I don't want to have the camera overheat. It's a little hot today. So what you would do now, we would just were working with our hand. Grab your racket right here, okay? Because here's the thing. We just started here as our contact structure. Now we grow, put our racket in our hand, but guess what? Those are different. The racket just grew, aka my hand just grew. This kind of weird thing of, like as I keep moving down, guess what? The contact structure actually moves. My hand, aka the racket, because now, funny joke, that the racket's my hand and it's longer than my other hand, just grew. And so now I need to start calibrating. So what I would have a student do is just move over, boom, okay? I'm not even trying to hit Thompson yet, okay? And then I would have them move down a little bit. Now, I before love I it. have them move down, we're going to talk about one thing i'm jumping a little bit around but again like i talked about peter talked about that there's a full course that'll break everything down for you we want to make sure you know that it, the course will open up monday september 25th at noon okay so we want to talk about a little bit about the wrist and how it works and why it's so important the wrist and the shoulder and we're gonna get a little technical but i'm gonna to try to really, really make it easy and i'm sure you've heard these terms you, everybody, I guarantee is super knowledgeable here. And so I'm gonna go through it a little quick. I know you've watched a bunch of videos. We're gonna talk about the, the wrist in a second. And I'm gonna, like I said, use technical terms, but I'm gonna make it easy. So the way our hand works or the wrist works, we have up and down, basically ulnar deviation, I call it pinky down and radial deviation, thumbs up, just like that, okay? And then we have flexion, uh, extension and flexion. So we have extension and flexion of the wrist, okay? Now, when we talk about starting to use the wrist, I want you to keep in mind that this is gonna be passively active. And you're probably saying, how can something be passively active, Kevin? We'll, we'll get there. Now, from here, I want you to think about the next thing is we have supination and pronation. Supination, you're holding a cup of soup. There's this guy on YouTube that talks about this. And then pronation is you're in a football huddle and you're with the pros and you're going, come on, put your hand on the huddle and let's go. Okay, so just, Easy little things to remember things like that. The other thing, and then we're gonna break it, break it down and then we'll come back to normal land, is we have shoulder, horizontal shoulder abduction. Woo. Okay, meaning basically moving your shoulder forward. And sometimes you bend your elbow. The reason I talk about this, and in the past I probably didn't wanna talk about it because it's like, whoa, but it allows me to be super specific. How many times have you heard somebody say, hey, just snap through the ball? What does that mean? Am I Am I, am I pronating? Am I, am I flexing? 
Am I having radial or thumbs up deviation? Well, which snap and why? Or, and so you, you're kind of lost in this fog about what, what am I going to do? And so let's kind of break it down, at least from my perspective, what these things can help you understand and do now that we have the contact structure. If I have ulnar and radial deviation here, basically thumbs up, pinky down, thumbs up, and I grab the racket here, look what that does. Okay? But in relationship to the ball, if I just do that, the ball has spin on it. So right now, that's one factor of creating spin. Now, there is another factor of creating spin, which is something that we've probably all taught, I've taught to, which is get under the ball and brush up. They are both correct. Now, here's the difference. This one is more effective because it allows you to do something else with your shoulder. If my shoulder is coming up like this, it can't be coming forward, which means we won't get as much penetration and spin. And so that's the other thing. Other thing is coming up like this, the shoulder's a little bit weaker of a muscle. And so this is why I'm talking about this. Now, the next thing is you have the flexion and extension. So if I just do this casually like this, you can see how much power the ball has, but it has no control, mm. okay? But here's what we can do. We can start adding a bit of both. So if I added a bit of both, and this is where I do wish I, I could do this at a different location where I had a wall, what I would do is basically take the ball and start brushing it. Now, here's the thing, before we get super technical, if you had your hand and you wanted to brush the ball, just like we talked about, what would you do? You'd probably take the ball just like this and go like this, what? Now you can't probably see that because of the video, but that ball has spin on it. What did I do? I just used my fingertips and I did two things. I did a little a bit of radial deviation and extension. Now, the question is the thing I'm, I'm, I'm almost promised someone's thing is like, but well, I'm gonna overuse my wrist and I'm probably injure my wrist. If you did it actively, yes. And this is where the passive actively, a passive active um, comes in hand. If you think about the analogy of your car breaking down, hopefully no one's had that experience. I've had that experience, but I'm sure we've all been through it. Yes. And you have to push your car. <laughs> it's like, yes, I've been there, but you have to push your, push your car. The first part of pushing your car sucks. You usually have some poor guy who's helping or somebody's helping or poor, and you're both pushing or pushing or pushing. And, but what happened? It gets going. And suddenly you went from using your entire body that literally you can just like, I mean, barring that it's flat ground, you can just sit there and like jog. And like, I've been in my car, just like, like, a, like on a skateboard pushing and, and after I get it going. And this is what I mean by passively actively. If we start moving my arm forward and I'm relaxed, sorry, I'm going to jump back here. If I take my wrist like this and grab it with my non-dominant hand and I relax my wrist, this is a key factor relaxing. Look what happens. A lot of this happens on its own. So I could just guide it. And I'm going to show you a drill in a second to make sure you have the right amount of both. And so if we go back to the hand idea, if I just do this, guess what? I get spin. Okay. And so if I now come back to, again, the rack is just an extension of my hand and I start focusing on this. Now I'm not gonna try to hit it over. We're not trying to create power. We're just going from our structure point and going here. Look what I can do. That ball is spinning and moving forward. I'm not trying to get it over because I'm too far back and this wouldn't be the means of how you would get it over. But basically you can start moving around just like we did and you're starting to hit spin already, okay? And the thing is when you hit spin like that, you start to feel the ball. It stays on the string. There's this connection that you're making with the string compared to like if you just hit it normal you ever feel like you hit it like that and the ball's already gone and you're like uh wh what do i do uh how, how how do i how do i get it in and so the drill i have for you is the no no drill uh let me actually stop here is there any questions pete i can get on a rampage no no you're doing fine not not many questions since um uh, you know oh wait let's see this uh, this is actually good because it's kind of like talking about relaxation and everything. I Lindsay and Andrew say, I'd love to hear Kevin's tips on maintaining the magic level of relaxation through contact. I struggle with that very much. Tensing up right before contact is so hard to stop. That's a that's a very good question I think a lot of people are going to relate to. Okay, cool. So tensing up a little bit right at contact, I'm actually okay with. Because here's the thing, I think what, what most people are really experiencing is they're tensing up before contact. And so 
if you think about what we've been doing here, and I'm not gonna get super technical about it, but if you just watch my arm for a second. This is, I think, the magical level of relaxation. Just take your hand and have it kind of come through. And so I'm gonna jump to hitting the ball normal for a second. But if I just do exactly what we've been talking about like this, I can even, sorry, even if I tense up at contact, the weight of the racket is gonna still have the racket come through. Generally what I see with a lot of recreational players or players is that we do this and we're tense already before we've even sped the racket up. And so now this is tough. So, and to be honest, you're gonna experience different levels of tension at contact. It depends on the situation. And this is why, you know, sometimes we're looking for that one answer. There is no one answer. There's been many a times where, let's say you get a ball from a service, re, uh, a serve, and you're gonna be a little bit more tense and not do that much and just kind of hold the racket out there to send it back. Again, if you watch a lot of uh, professional players, you'll see different levels of relaxation and tension based on what they want. And so hopefully that answers your question. Good stuff. Yeah. Okay. Let's go to the next thing. Okay. So if we understand this, I'm going to show you what I call the no-no drill. So if you have kids or you've ever had to say no-no to somebody, no-no. And so <laughs> what no-no represents is if I do no-no this way, if I point my finger down and I point my finger forward, this is a combination of both radial deviation and extension. Okay. And so I'm going to demonstrate each one, each variant that we talked about. So meaning just if I use my wrist coming pinky up, pinky down, uh, basically radial deviation, okay? Lots of spin doesn't go anywhere. This is if I kind of pull the racket forward a little bit and just flex through it here. But if I'm going no-no, and I'm gonna actually keep my finger here, I'm not saying you should do that during a match, but just as a reference of where my racket is. So you can see where it's pointing right now, and I'm gonna have it point forward, and this is what you're gonna get. You have the blend of what you want to have both drive and spin. But here's the thing. Because we're playing a dynamic game, there is no one perfect thing about that. And that's the key about understanding these things. Because guess what? Uh, emergency timeout, that? Kevin. Emergency timeout. Okay. We, have, okay. we have with us, he has 10 billion subscribers on YouTube. Oh, Ryan, Ryan Reedy. We must all stop and say... You got this. All right, go oh, ahead. I love it. So, so we have this perfect blend of both of these things happening. Okay, perfect blend allowing you to do that. Now, what I was saying before is you're going to get in some situations. Have you ever seen someone get in a problem where the ball's coming deep? And what are you doing? Did I go through the ball? No, I don't need to add any more force to a ball that already has force on it. So I'm going to probably come up on the ball using more radial deviation. Now, again, we don't have to get technical. The no-no finger is just gonna come up. And that's the way I like doing things sometimes. And so, again, all the tension is just sitting here on the hand. And so what I would recommend is as you get proficient in this, you start understanding that basically, what we talked about with the shoulder, the arm moves first, and then it builds up that speed. If I'm really relaxed with my racket here, and I move my racket forward just using my arm, look what happens to the, the, the frame the weight of the racket does everything else. So I'm not actively doing something with my wrist. I'm basically guiding it where I want it to go. So we start with our contact position. This is just moving my shoulder forward here and then doing what we've all been talking about. So I've been doing it here. I'm gonna start scooting down on the racket just to jump ahead. And so now you're getting a feel for the ball. Now, any questions there? No, I, I think it's great. I really like I really like this progression and you know that's the key, guys. You know, if you want to make the stroke simple, I mean all these drills are easy to do, but you notice they're building blocks and, and, and you know the more you're willing to do these simple little exercises, the whole puzzle gets easier to solve. I think it's tough, like Kevin says, when you start out Let's get you in the unit turn. Let's get the rapid racket drop going. Now let's go into the wrist lag. Now let's pop the thing. You know, now let's do a Rafa buggy whip finish. Then, you know, doing that all right off the bat uh, gets tough. Now, here's the thing. This is my way of doing it. This is something that's helped me. There has been a lot of players that have been super successful. I'm looking for a way to make, get results quicker without having the, the, the frustration of it. So, 
depending on your style of how you like hearing things the progressions, maybe that and you're willing to do the time and the, the reps, that's totally fine. So I just want to put that out there. I'm not saying this is the only way, but I want to make this the quick way. Oh, my God. Wait, hold Where did oh. Kevin go? I, I'm oh, right here. What? We, got, we got Ian Westerman is Whoa, also on. Ian Westerman. What? This is a crazy. We got Ian uh, and Ryan on the same live stream. This is insane. This is insane. I love it. It's this just is the time. It's the time. People just, I mean, they got to have something to do for lunch. It's just because you're here. And we've already broke 100. <laughs> we got, oh my, we got Sir Gordon Tanner all the way over in Oxford saying tennis world Sweet. championships in Washington final stages in American Riviera. One set for the championship. Okay. So he likes to do like the real, the real tennis stuff. Okay. This is awesome. Sweet. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go away again and leave you back on the main stage because you are just killing it. I'm glad I'm killing it. So All right, go ahead. from here, if we understand, basically, I'm just pulling my shoulder forward, which we would pull any forward anyway from here. Boom. And I'm not worried about my follow through. Now, what you're going to see, because I'm jumping around a little bit, you're going to see a little bit of a follow through because the follow through, at least in my mind, is for the racket to decelerate. And you're going to see different follow throughs based on the type of shot you're hitting, whether I'm hitting an angle, where I'm hitting a drive, you're gonna just see different types of follow throughs. Now, I think for me, once you've got to this point and you can kind of walk around and the court and still be open and create the contact, you're probably asking, Kevin, but what about this turn? Everybody tell me I need a turn. What about creating more racket at speed? Well, this is where we start talking about the turn. But as we talk about the turn, we don't lose focus of the contact structure. The contact structure is so important. So if you want to create more power, we turn away so we can simply turn back into the contact structure, okay? This is the key. Instead of starting here and focusing on, okay, uh, oh, uh, oh, what's that? It makes more sense that we focus most of our attention, almost all of our attention on consistently making contact and what to do with the ball and how to make sure we're getting there. Now so we can start focusing on turning away turning away and I'll take you through all those drills like I said on the full course where you go through it I'll walk you step by step of how to do it but I'll give you a really quick drill right now that I found a lot of success with with learning how to turn back into the ball because I think that probably is one of the biggest uh, uh, things that hurt so many recreational players the inability to get their body to turn and they find themselves arming the ball okay let's go okay so here we go if we think about turning or being in the contact structure, and then we're gonna just turn our body. Now, one thing, whenever we're gonna rotate our body and we think about our feet, the only thing I want you to think about is relax, one thing. So be nice and relaxed. I'm gonna scoot back so you can see my feet. Relax, one thing, and then allow your heels to come off the ground, okay? Because if I'm here, my contact structure, and I rotate but not allow, oh, that, that hurts. My knee feels like it's gonna pop out of socket. Don't like it. So I'm gonna just relax and let my heel come off the ground. Now, from this position, I'm facing sideways. Now, let's just say, hey, I, we're not going to talk about stance just yet. Let's just say you're just in this position. You found yourself in this position. How, Kevin, can I work on turning? I think about grabbing my chest right here, okay? And I'm going to grab my chest. And what I'm going to do, basically, I'm going to keep my arm nice and relaxed. That same idea we had where we're just hitting the contact structure. By the way, if you didn't know this, if I turn this way, pretend I'm hitting the ball this way, I'm still in my contact structure. It's just sideways. So if I grab my chest and I pull my chest forward and allow my racket and my arm to relax, I start feeling this idea of pulling my chest and pulling my arm forward, okay? Pulling my chest and pulling my arm forward. That's a great way to start the idea. And so what I would do here is I'm gonna segment it. I'm gonna pull my chest and pull my arm forward. Now you'll find that when you pull, I'll do it from this angle, when you pull your chest forward, a lot of times you'll find the shoulder go a little bit further in front. That's totally fine. You'll see a different range of pros. I prefer, that if you're gonna do it, pull that shoulder a little bit in front. The next thing, because we might be thinking about, do we have a question? No, we're doing great. Okay, I know, I heard a deep breath. I was like, okay, get ready for the question. <laughs> so the next thing, if we're th starting to think about this, and I'm like I said, I'm flying through these progressions, they will all be there for you on Monday. So if I take a ball just like this, and actually let's do it without a ball. We were pulling our chest forward, okay, to contact. Now, if I have my hand out here, this also will help us track the ball. What I can practice with my hand, we've just went from hand here, I'm gonna put my hand on my chest, okay? Put my hand on my chest a couple of times, so then I'm gonna pull it to the side. So we're just practicing moving it out of the way. And so now, 
I can drop a ball. And what I'm going to do is think of pulling my chest and my hand out of the way. Okay. And I'm jumping in progressions here, but this is a simple way of where you're starting to learn to rotate. But guess what? I honestly think rotation is secondary to making the contact point because what I'm really focusing on when I'm turning away is making sure I have enough time to get to the contact structure. I hit that forehand hard just because I rotated more, but it doesn't matter how much I rotate. If I hit the ball back here, as I start uncoiling, I, I can't control the ball. And so it only matters how much you're gonna rotate as long as you can get to this point. So sometimes I may not have that much time. So guess what? My rotation might be small, AKA return to serve. If the ball's coming really fast, you've seen Djokovic, ball's coming really fast, super small rotation, but he makes sure he gets to the contact structure. Okay? Mm. Uh, you see players like uh, an Alcraz, boom. Big rotation, but he always gets back to the contact structure. One more thing now that I bring up Alcraz. There's different contact or uh, different uh, um, hitting structures, meaning there's a straight arm and there's a bent arm. It's pretty much the same. So if you're wondering like, he's only been doing one, it's the same. So if I'm a bent arm, I'm a bent arm player, okay? If you're straight arm, you're just gonna extend out, okay? As far as the muscles you use, where we talked about uh, pronation, supination, the only difference, you're gonna probably use more internal shoulder rotation, meaning your entire shoulder is gonna be rotating in and out. Internal, sorry, external and internal shoulder rotation versus if you're bent arm, you're gonna probably use more uh, pronation as you hit toxin on your forehand. So just in case you're wondering, bent arm, straight arm, we can still do everything. Mm, good stuff. Okay, so now there's a really good question from Christopher. And what did I know about Christopher too? He seems like a really good player. He's always commenting, he's always playing tournaments, doing pretty well. And then actually I'm gonna ask a follow-up question. So I'm gonna come back here because Kevin and I might have a little debate here and Ooh. we might either come to an agreement or <laughs> we might abruptly end this live stream and never talk again. Okay. It'll, 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 it'll be like, it'll be like the Beatles breaking up. Like it's going to be devastating <laughs> for everybody, but uh, no, I'm pretty sure we can work it out. But anyway, so I'm going to come back. So let's okay. uh, pull you out of the solo shot. So I'm back. And then Christopher says, so you're advising the chest pulls or leads the, the, the arm uh, forward. Now, before you answer that, let me kind of explain my thing. And then you can kind of tell me if you agree or disagree with me, or, or maybe we can come up with a, a common ground. So you're right. When you watch the pros play, right? I mean, you're always going to see them hitting and they're here. Right. And lots of times you're just seeing this really cool looking, you know, rough and a Dow shot. And there's lots of instruction on, you know, pulling that that chest in. Now, I have found through the years that a lot of recreational players who focus on that, especially men, they are really focused on that. And then they end up kind of pulling away from the contact, which we talked about is so important. Lots of shanks, lots of like dead spinny balls going almost like off to the <laughs> side to the doubles alley. So to combat that, because I'm not debating that that happens, but but the people really focus on that. I find that for the men, it doesn't work great. They, they're just super erratic. And then every once in a while, they'll hit a ball a million miles an hour. So I, I like to teach. And let me know if you like or di don't like this. I, I'll be fine either way. Um, I like to teach the love story. So I like to have, you know, this is the female – this is the the boy. They're in love and you know they're they're kind of together in the beginning and then he's chasing her, right? To contact. And you can still see him even though this is here, we're still kind of pulling like Kevin's saying and then they fall in love at the end and get married. You know, just for your basic stroke because, you know, of course you can have different follow throughs and everything. So are we like totally off disagreeing on be this or wh what are we thinking? So here I'll bring it up this way. And I'm trying to think of it from, when we think about all, the, if we boil everything down that we're trying to do, when I kind of think about a stroke and kind of want to really break it down, I've, we've talked about this, but I really think about it as a stroke is just a way of transferring power from the ground up through your body and then to the racket or to the ball. And so everything is linked. So we have basically a kinetic chain coming up from the ground 
which is where we bend to store energy, okay? The reason we coil is so when we bend, we can start turning our hips to turn our shoulders a little bit more and then hit the ball. And so the reason I would say, if I have my shoulders like this, or I'll have it like this for a second, and I'll do it this way. If my shoulders are relaxed but straight, if I push this shoulder back, this shoulder's gonna come forward. They have to work in tandem. It'd be very hard for them to be here, okay? So does that make sense? Meaning that, like, if I just take my hands, maybe this will be a better example, and I push this shoulder, this shoulder, <laughs> it's opposite, sorry, it's opposite of when I'm looking at the mirror, uh, the, the video. If I push this shoulder back, this one has to come forward. If I push this shoulder back, this one has to come forward. And so, for me, when I'm thinking, if I have the alignment of when I, we're taking the racket back and we have this hitting arm structure basically here, this elbow is lined up in the correct position here. And so what I wanna do is really focus on just having my shoulder turn and boom, we're moving, one shoulder's moving the other, allowing the energy to then transfer around. If my hands start doing this too early without my shoulders moving, then really all the energy that I'm taking just kind of got hijacked. It's that, it doesn't get the transfer because now I'm basically doing this with my arm. Versus if I'm here, let's say we do a racket drop, if I do nothing at all, just by the pure fact that I'm rotated and I start rotating my hips, the racket moves without my arm doing anything. Now, with that, you have some separation. Meaning that if you look at your, if you have my hips and my shoulders, we can rotate my shoulders past my hips. So my hip is probably rotated here. Okay, if you can see that line, my shoulders past it. I think it's something like 45 degrees that your hips can maybe go, don't quote me on it, but go past your shoulders. And so the more we stretch that, the hip as it comes through acts as like a, a, a rubber band and it slings that shoulder around. Now, one thing I do agree with you, Pete, is that these things need to be done through progression. Meaning that if I'm here and I'm just starting off very easily, I'm just gonna focus on turning to the contact structure and then relaxing my arm. Okay, just start with that. Get familiar with that, get familiar with feeling the ball. As you start developing more racket at speed, you have two options of how you can transfer that power. Djokovic is one, um, uh, one example of it, and I think Federer and Alcaraz is another. Djokovic, when he tends to rotate on his forehand side, he doesn't really, what I would say, he rotates his shoulder through, and this is also a, a, a cause of his grip and his structure and everything else set up. He rotates his, his shoulder through to get more penetration on the ball. If you watch Djokovic, his shoulder generally, when he hits the ball, is much further past, unless he's hitting like a casual ball. But if he's loading up, trying to hit the ball, that shoulder's past. You also see that with like a Dominic King. But if you watch Federer, and I, I struggle understanding this for a long time, and you watch like a, uh, an Alcaraz, their shoulder actually sometimes stops for a split second, and then they transfer the power, and then the arm brings the shoulder around. The example of this is this. If you think about a car, and if you're in the car, and you didn't buckle up, and you hit a brick wall, guess what happens? All that energy gets transferred to you, and you go flying. So if I take my racket like this, and I just rotate, great. I can still rotate fast and get a lot of power, but watch what happens when I stop. That racket, all that energy gets transferred forward. And so, you can still do that with the bent arm structure. So, sorry, I'm going off on a tangent of, you're trying to basically make sure you do the best of transferring the energy up. And so when you're talking about the, I love, by the way, this is the thing I love about Pete. He comes up with these like stories. I will remember the love story forever. It's, it's burnt into the brain. <laughs> and so my only concern with the love story is that the hands stay too close together. And so you don't get the, uh, the benefit of, your shoulder stretching here. It's very similar in the serve. The serve and the forehand are very similar in the sense that basically you're stretching your shoulders. The difference in the serve, we're stretching it up, okay? We're stretching it up this way. And you see this exchange of shoulders. But what you see with a lot of recreational players, they are like this. There's no stretch. And so what they wind up doing is arming the ball. They don't get the sensation of as they pull the shoulder, they feel the energy transfer through the shoulder and then to the arm. So long answer, hopefully it, it, it answers your question. Okay, first of all, great, great stuff. Uh, so yeah, so I mean, you can see Kevin and I dis disagree a little bit on this. Um, 
and and as you're talking again guys it's it's undeniable what he's saying what he's saying is right what you're saying is right in my opinion even myself who focuses on the love story if you're looking at me hitting lots of times when i'm hitting i'm exactly what you're talking about and this and this arm leaves for a little bit but it kind of reminds me of what tiger wood says is is feel matching real and so I just find that a lot of recreational players that are hearing what you're saying and trying to do all this pull off the ball very quickly, in my experience. It's hard yeah. for them. And so when you have this and you're just more, you're just doing this, everything's still flowing through the same way. But when you feel that both hands are following each other, I find it's easier to stay connected, just like if you were to do a putt-putt golf shot or a driving range shot, and you'll see the pros that lots of times when they hit, they have a buggy whip for him, but when they're on the practice court, they're warming up, they still like, they'll use both hands to, to the follow through. And so that, that's all I'm saying. Like even when oh, I'm yeah, serving, yeah. when I'm serving, right, I got this hand up here, and when I'm hitting, uh, we tuck. Right. But I find, again, the recreational players who go, OK, you got to tuck your arm in here. <laughs> Lots of them will throw the ball up, tuck and hit their serve. <laughs> and even though I tuck. Right. That's the real. That's the realness of it. Yeah. My my feel is, is that I'm trying to beat gravity. I'm trying to hold this hand up here and I'm imagine I'm looking like this as I'm hitting so that I'm more connected. I, I just find when people are trying to like who aren't as talented as you trying to emulate what you're doing, they don't have the coordination to do that and stay with the ball. That's, that's my only debate. Now. So I 100% agree with you in the sense of what we just talked about. I almost don't talk about until we've established so much consistent feel for the hitting structure, the hitting structure, that thing has to be locked down before we start doing anything. Because I think what you're talking about when people are doing like they're going too far, this isn't the hitting structure. This is yeah. a broken structure. And so this is why we spent almost so much of the call on like getting to the hitting structure, getting to the hitting structure. And no matter what you do, as we start accelerating, boom, the timing to get here is so important. And that's what I 100% I feel that it's so important. And so as we talk about this and I'm answering the question, yes, I'll go technical and what my, but honestly, this wouldn't happen and so that hitting structure is like a, a foundation of a house that you've poured the concrete, leveled it off, and you know it's there because we're building on that. And everything has to be, that has to be there. And so when you're finding that players, are, oh, you all right? <laughs> no, I'm going to die. No, I'm all right. I just, bad, <laughs> bad swallow. Bad, bad, um, all right. I, you know what? I got to get out of it. I'm, I'm going, you're back to solo structure. <laughs> I'm getting out of here. Was there another question? No, go, go, go for it. Okay, Is there so any more? Basically, I mean, here's the thing. The rest of it's going to be all in the course on Monday. I've jumped okay. around, but here's the, the, if I wrap everything up, if you improve your structure, meaning hitting the ball here, learning to consistently hit the ball here, it allows you, then when you start accelerating, I'm hitting the structure, but I know where I need to hit the ball. And I, this is all I'm focusing on. When I'm rotating, it's like almost like I almost put it akin to this. If, if, if I'm here, sitting here and I just turn to talk to you and I turn back, I mean, it's so casual and so natural. Like, oh, I'm just going to turn and turn back. That's what I want it to feel like. Because I think when we start talking about, okay, how we can uh, stretch the shoulders, and but that's, that goes back to my kind of rule number one. It's like we're focusing too much. We're focusing too much on these little gritty, nitty things that if you really focus on the structure and just start to feel here, you'll start to feel like, oh, this feels so much better. This is what I need to make sure I get. And it also informs you when your balls are going off or going weird. It's like, am I hitting the structure? And then there's some other things like racket face and racket, how you're approaching the ball. that will make a huge difference. Good stuff. We, I think we just lost you. Are you still there? What? No, I'm here. I'm here. Can you okay. hear me? Yeah, I just put it, I just put in another link. All right, I'm coming back. Um, Pete's coming back. We're back. Okay, I've stopped. I've stopped uh, choking on the water there. I'm I'm good. <laughs> and uh, we we're over 101 people. Yeah. 
This was a great lesson, Kevin, as always. Oh, well, I appreciate it. And you going above and beyond, going on the court. Remember, guys, go get Kevin's free train. I put a couple times in the uh, the links here. If you, you probably are on my email. The way you got here, most likely, is you're either on my email list or on Kevin's email list. So we put the links, I'm assuming. you. I know I definitely did. I'm sure Kevin did as well. So you can have that free train if you go to the email. And I'll also, again, put it in the chat. So make sure he's giving this away for free on Monday. Yep. And and Kevin, you are this year, I believe you're working on the backhand return for the Tennis Con 7 presentation. Is that correct? Oh, so you'll hear you. I am. And you'll hear more about the structure because that is basically a key to making sure you hit good backhand returns. Yeah. So that's going to start October 23rd, the week of October 23rd. And uh, we're going to have a great time at Tennis Con 7. We have an amazing lineup. As you can see, these coaches are awesome. They think deeper about the game than your normal coach. Somebody like said, we have, because we had, you were on, Ian was on, Ryan was oh. on. And they, they said it's like, oh. the, it's like the, the Tennis Avengers were on today. <laughs> I love that line. I love that line. So thank you for that. And the so, yeah, That's it's good. the Tennis Avengers of coaching. So make sure you go to TennisCon7.com, sign up. And also, once you sign up, guys, you're going to get a free lesson with Day Day and Day Tree of Racket Flex on the forehand. Oh, wow. And uh, and so, you, but but you'll also see that you have the the lowest possible price to upgrade for just sixty seven dollars. The cost of less now with inflation, less than one private <laughs> lesson with your local pro. So I mean, it's dirt cheap. And uh, we're going to be doing cool things like extra bonus live lessons this year, just for members only. So on Monday. Richard Bryce is going to help you bulletproof your hip if you upgrade. And that will just be for members only. Um, Kevin, anything else to say? Any parting words? I just want to say thank you for having me on. Um, these are always awesome. I love talking to you. It's like you bring out the best. You're just like you have this personality that I mean, like you just make people smile. I've <laughs> met you the first time. We've known each other for so long. I'm giving Peter a plug here. Met you. I've known you for how long? It's been like a long time. A long time. And Met you in person, Tennis Con Live. You're awesome. You're <laughs> absolutely awesome. So I just want to give you kudos to how good of a job you do. And just like Pete, Pete just texts me and like checks in on me. I mean, like who does that? Pete. <laughs> I mean, so it's, I, I appreciate that. And I appreciate what you do. Oh, well, thank you so much. I thank you so much. I know you guys loved it. We'll be back with more stuff. Make sure you're always tuning in to Kevin's. Uh, YouTube channel. He has amazing lessons on his YouTube channel. Uh, and are you doing all the Instagrams and the TikToks yet? Are you, are you on doing the TikTok? Some Instagram. I'm not on the TikTok. I'm not on the TikTok. I'll be doing some, um, some Instagrams. You'll see a lot more of this content and this style of content coming out soon. I've kind of taken a break to, like I said, I've been doing a lot of research, a lot of testing things and changing things and uh, just working with people. And so we're, we're back and we're ready to start uh, getting some content out to you, help you start improving your game. Awesome, awesome. All right, guys, take care and have a good day. Thanks, guys.